it almost seems to me that to take up the other side, you have to hold some sort of strong multiple realizability claim. I So I do think that certain properties are multiply realizable, but I don't think that they're multiply realizable in quite the way that some of the proponents of multiple realizability historically suggested. So Jerry Fodor, who was one of the champions of multiple realizability, explicitly said things like, and the realizers need not have anything in common with each other, right. the, the physical realizers. Or he would say, it's a big mystery how all this higher level stuff is related to the, the underlying physical stuff. And I disagree with that 100%. I think there's multiple realizability, but it's not a mystery. It's that different lower level mechanisms can share aspects. Uh, you know, they can, they can share um, some of what they do. Um, so that's, that's all it means, multiple realizability. That, you know, when, when we look at a whole system, you know, yeah, this system can catch mice and this system can catch mice and this system can catch mice. They do it in different ways. But the result, in, you know, at one level is the same. The, my, the mouse gets caught. You know, and it's not a big mystery and it, and it doesn't mean that therefore there's nothing in common between the systems. Yes, there is. They catch mice. That's what they have in common. And it's a physical thing. The, my, the mouse is caught. So, um, so, so it's a perfectly physical um, aspect that these things share. Okay, so it's fine to hold multiple realizability, but you just can't. Uh... You just can't have a simple view of computation. Then. You just can't think that it's all one kind of computation. You need to realize the distinctiveness of the, of the underlying mechanisms. Yes, yes. And um, for any type of computation, you can have multiple realizability, not only of the mm, components, but even of the vehicles that they manipulate. So, you know, for a for, a mouse trap, you know, you can have different mechanisms, but the vehicle, so called, is always the same. You know, they always have to catch mice. But for a computational device, they don't have to catch mice. They don't have to. They don't have to do anything in particular. That's it's a particular physical um, result. They just have to have something, some physical variable with the right degrees of freedom. Um, so, and then they have to be able to generate the right relationship between the input variable and the output variable. But there are still different types of variable. So not all variables are the same. Some variables are what I call strings of digits, not that it's an especially original label, but um, that's what's needed for digital computation. Other variables are so-called real variables or continuous variables. So the value of the variable at all times matters because the most important operation is integration. That's what, that's what analog computers um, manipulate or at least can manipulate. You know, they're not limited to digital variables. They can use these continuous variables as well and they can integrate them. So, that's a different kind of system. It's a different kind of computational device. And it needs to be understood in its own way, even though it's still multiply realizable. And I think neural computation is still different from both of those. So yeah, we need to understand what that is. So computation is all about the vehicle that you're computing over and how it's constrained. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the relationships between you know, the input variables, the output variables, and everything in between, because there's all kinds of internal states. And, and in fact, you know, in a brain, there's lots and lots of internal states. And there's all these internal representations that are updated at all times. And they update themselves too, you know, because there's a lot of intrinsic dynamics that keeps the, the states updated and keeps, meaning they're trying to simulate how things evolve. And then they also try to figure out what to do about everything. Yeah, it's, it's very puzzling. It's, I think when you're learning computability theory for the first time, uh, that's very unclear. Uh, I mean, I, I guess if you're learning computer science without considering the theoretical element, it's, it's very unclear. But 
you kind of led to led to buying into something like a strong version of of Turing Church thesis. So, yeah, the Church Turing thesis is the thesis that what is intuitively computable is computable by Turing machines. And initially, it was just a thesis about uh, essentially about digital computation or, you know, computation within formal logical systems, which is digital computation, because these are, you know, systems in formal logic. Um, But then people started worrying about, okay, but how do we extend this to the physical world? You know, can we say, is it plausible that any, any machine that you could build to, to, to perform computations can, can only do things that can also be done or computed by a Turing machine. And so, and then there was a whole proliferation of thesis like that. Um, and I've looked at that a little bit and my tentative conclusion is um, there's no solid serious evidence that, uh, that, that we can construct physical systems that can compute anything beyond what a Turing machine can compute or that brains could do anything uh, or could compute anything beyond what Turing machines could compute. But that is also an oversimplification because, um, because, because I just argued that neural computations are not digital computations. So, then what does it even mean to say that? Well, what it means is that as much randomness as there is in, in, in brain processes, and there's a lot of stochasticity and random elements, um, if you can you know, encode what the brain is trying to do, or maybe a, in an approximate way in a digital format, then the 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 kind of inference or problem solving or you know intellectual task that the brain is performing is not going to be able to give you a solution to a problem in digital form that a Turing machine cannot reach. Okay, so it, I mean I'm trying to be a little more careful here, but it boils down to a version of the kind of physical church doing thesis um, and, and the, the way to illustrate it is have you ever found anybody who can solve problems that a Turing machine cannot solve and I I'm not aware of anything you know like people have tried you have tried to say oh like but we can write stories and stories of you know are open-ended and you know what what could a computer do about that Yeah, but that's not a well-defined mathematical problem. So yes, you know, we're creative, sure. But but that doesn't amount to solving a problem that's not Turing computable. It's it's a it's something that it's 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 an interesting question. To what degree can a computer do something like that? Um, but it but there's no like solid way, like precise way of saying yes, and this amounts to computing a mathematical function that it's not Turing computable. So, I mean, like, you know, take any, your favorite example of a Turing uncomputable function, like the halting problem for Turing machines. Well, I mean, nobody can just stare at the problem and find the solution and say, oh yeah, I know, here, I'll give you the answer. Yeah, that would be an example of human beings computing something or somehow finding the solution to a problem that's not Turing computable, but nobody can do that.